<laughs> uh, thanks. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to be able to share this work um, and continue to plug the value of seagrass um, ecosystems. So uh, at the outset, um, I just want to acknowledge that the work I'm talking about has been possible because of a series, um, an increasingly um, growing series of fantastic partnerships that have developed um, over the past few years between a number of different people, including Swansea University, Cardiff University, WWF, WWF UK, um, Sky Ocean Rescue, uh, Project Seagrass, um, Pembrokeshire Coastal Forum, Pentlin Asane, Special Area of Conservation, and a number of others um, that have been working together to basically gain recognition for seagrass meadows in the first instance and push for restoration of seagrass um, in the UK and elsewhere. So <clears throat> with that, just for some context, um, why seagrass is important um, and, and why, sh why should we restore it? Um, and, and why should we include and prioritize it within marine spatial planning um, frameworks? So seagrasses are flowering plants that have adapted over millions of years to life underwater in the sea. And they're the only truly marine angiosperm and so very different organisms to seaweeds. They're a foundation species um, and they're ecological engineers. They're highly productive. Um, they, they provide a huge suite of ecosystem services. Um, and this, this is set in a UK contact, context that, you know, these, this includes carbon sequestration, um, biodiversity support, nitrogen um, cycling and coastal protection. Um, that they're also a near global resource um, and of so of exceptionally high conservation globally, conservation valuable. Um, they're covered by multiple international and national designations, including definition of indicators uh, of the health of coastal waters by the Water Framework Directive due to um, the, the measurable and very rapid responses to change. Uh, their relative simplicity as a marine ecosystem also makes them really good model systems to investigate a suite of ecological theory. So they're really nice to work on. Um, and it's, it's important to note that any seagrass conservation solutions do have significant global scale implications. So as I've said, seagrass is found across the globe. Um, it's found in shallow seas on the continental shelf um, and grows on all continents apart from Antarctica. So it thrives in both tropical and colder temp temperate regions. There are uh, around 72 species of seagrass globally um, and different species have adapted to life in their, in their different um, surrounding environmental conditions. So seagrass grows in soft sediment intertidal to subtidal areas um, and they prefer sheltered places like shallow bays and um, lagoons and estuaries um, where, where you've got limited wave action and high light nutrient levels. Um, they can be found around 60 meters deep. Um, in the UK, they, they're, they're usually, the, the, the deepest they'll be found is around five or six meters in most cases. Um, tidal exposure, wave action, uh, water clarity and low salinity control seagrass at their shallow edge nearest um, the shore. So, as I've said, seagrass distribution is widespread and it's widespread across its range, um, but it can be patchy and highly fragmented. It's also a very dynamic habitat, um, all of which combines to make it very difficult to map. Um, estimates of global spatial distribution uh, differ massively throughout the literature that's published, um, ranging from 170,000 to around 600,000 square kilometers. Um, with some, some models suggesting that the distribution might be in uh, magnet orders of magnitude higher than that. But the most recent estimate that's been made uh, with moderate to high confidence is around 160,000 kilometres squared, possibly 250,000 with, with a lower level of confidence. Um, this figure just shows the compiled seagrass area that's been mapped from existing data relative to maximum potential seagrass area that's been modeled within each of um, six 
uh, bioregions for seagrass across the globe. And it just, it, it just highlights uh, quite clearly that accurate estimates of seagrass cover are challenged by these large areas that are unmapped basically. Um, but the need for this more accurate mapping is more important now than, than it's ever been. Um, in the UK, seagrass is especially poorly mapped um, with widespread and very patchy distribution. And that makes estimates difficult as well as actual mapping. Um, but the best estimate of coverage that we have right now is around 131 kilometers squared um, with moderate to high confidence. Um, in recent years, since 1998, around 85 kilometers have been mapped. So we know that, that that's there. Um, across the temperate North Atlantic as a whole, seagrass area relative to coastline length is 0.01% um, and it's 1.21% of the global total. It's relatively small. <clears throat> Excuse me. The common seagrass species in the UK are Zostra mariner, uh, which is known as eelgrass, and Zostra nolti, which is dwarf eelgrass. Um, and these are the two generally accepted species of seagrass that, that we've got here. Um, UK seagrass meadows are very, very productive, um, just like seagrass meadows elsewhere in the world. Um, in North Wales, for example, you know, a single meadow has been found to harbour over 50 species, different species of fish. Um, they're enormously underappreciated still. Um, they're a resource that supports our fisheries help to keep our seas clean, help protect our coastlines um, and have significant capacity to contribute towards climate change mitigation. So of those 85 kilometres squared that have been mapped in the UK, um, there's a very recent estimate that's come out that um, that equates to around 22 million pounds worth of carbon <clears throat> stored. It's around 0.9 excuse me, megatons. Um, and because of the seagrass loss and the habitat that has potential for seagrass to be restored, it just demonstrates that there is vast, um, there, there's vast potential to restore seagrass to support um, carbon sequestration as well as other ecosystem services that it provides. But as well as um, historical loss, seagrass um, remains a habitat very much under threat regardless of their importance. Um, around 58% of seagrass meadows globally have lost all or part of their distribution with overall loss since the 80s estimated um, on a global scale at around 7% per year. Um, and the UK is no exception and is, is possibly in the extreme um, having lost up to 92% of its cover since the 1930s with around 40% of that loss occurring in the last 40 years alone. Um, <clears throat> and where empirical data does exist, it, it generally um, documents a decline in the size or health of seagrass meadows. Um, poor water quality and land reclamation are the biggest causes of loss, but other direct physical damage um, is also a major problem for seagrass. Our knowledge of the historical loss of seagrass in Wales is limited to more recent records, but we do know that a range of sites that were once recorded to contain seagrass no longer have any coverage at all. Um, records of seagrass exist from along South Wales coast um, around the Gower and Swansea, um, as well as Cardiff and Newport, but it's not present um, in any meaningful scale in these areas, um, although you do get small patches. Um, in the Milford Haven waterway, a range of sites have got historical records of seagrass presence, but it's just, it's not there anymore um, on any meaningful scale. So after large scale loss, um, seagrass meadows tend not to recover. Um, recruitment's minimal um, and the system usually ends up in a state of negative feedback characterized by um, anoxic sediments and mobile sediments and high turbidity. Um, where the stressor that caused the loss remains, obviously it's not going to recover at all, uh, but there's evidence that large areas of seagrass have been lost in the UK um, over these long periods. 
as a result of poor water quality um, and that's changed. Um, so, the, the, so there is, is potential to restore in these areas where the threat has been removed, um, but that, rest, that, that um, restoration of the seagrass meadows needs some physical help. Um, the loss of seagrass in the UK as well is, is very marked because we've got um, completely altered generational baselines. Um, so in living memory, people remember places like the, the Solent or Stranford Loch as being carpeted by seagrass and that, that just isn't the case anymore. So in the face of both a climate emergency and a biodiversity crisis, we can't just allow these losses to continue um, and action to reverse the loss is increasingly urgent. Um, so but despite the suite of ecosystem services that seagrasses provide, in particular their biodiversity and fisheries support, which is largely underestimated um, in general knowledge, a major driver towards rejuvenation so far has been the climate mitigation angle. Um, and actually, as a, an aside, through Project Seagrass, we, we've gained um, increasing interest from um, different corporates that are wanting to offset their emissions by planting seagrass. Um, and obviously, there, there, there is an increasing emphasis on natural solutions um, to, climate, to the climate crisis and the role that nature can play in reducing atmospheric carbon. Um, in the marine ecosystems, the, the, the reference is to blue carbon, and it, that does represent a key part of strategies to reduce carbon in the atmosphere. Um, and seagrass is a key ecosystem with a potentially enormous contribution to make to blue carbon, um, as, as I've alluded to. But at the moment, we're not there in the UK with the, the, the figures are not clear enough um, so, so that we can provide accurate estimates of the carbon capture capacity alone. Um, however, seagrass is, it goes beyond carbon and it is uh, these other ecosystem services that we really need to think of um, and a whole system approach to why we would restore seagrass meadows. Um, uh, at, at the moment though, in the carbon context and a global scale, while seagrass occupies around 2% of the sea floor, it accounts for more than 10% of the carbon captured in oceans per year. Um, so you can see how significant that is. Um, so restoration um, in the UK is required. Seagrass it, 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 is not going to recover on, it, on its own um, as is, given the largely fragmented state of the seagrass stock. Um, so the movement of propagules, seeds and fragments to facilitate recovery of loss is not going to be enough to assist with recovery on its own, even when those threats are removed. Um, and this is especially the case where the surrounding seagrass or the nearest seagrass is in a poor state. Um, so restoration using seeds from healthy meadows um, is the only way that, that we, can, we can achieve this. So to date, um, there have been, um, until our project, no large-scale demonstrable um, seagrass restoration projects in the UK. Um, there have only been trials. Um, lots of these have been unsuccessful, and so really to date, recovery and restoration at scale has seen, been seen to be too complex and too expensive and uh, too unreliable. However, we know from other parts of the world that it is possible to restore seagrass at scale um, and consequently reinvigorate coastal seas. Um, Chesapeake Bay is one of possibly the prime example of it's such it's an amazing success story where they've restored thousands of hectares of seagrass and they have brought back biodiversity um, and healthy coastal systems it's it's absolutely incredible um but the, they 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 have scaled up their restoration efforts over years um a, a process is mechanized they've got special machinery to collect seeds process seeds and help plant seeds um, and we're moving towards that here. Um, but since 2013, uh, Swansea University, Cardiff University and Project Seagrass have been working on a range of methodological trials, um, building on the, the evidence from Chesapeake Bay. 
um, but putting it in the context of our, our own specific environment. Um, and, they, and these trials have shown that seagrass is possible, seagrass restoration is possible, um, using fairly simple and low risk techniques um, where we've been seeding small hessian bags and anchoring them to the sediment. And that is working really well. Um, restoration does present a challenge because so far, looking at more widespread figures, only 30% of restoration projects globally have been successful. Uh, but in-depth analysis of the failures points to the needs for projects to be expanded in size um, because that increases success rates. Um, and so this is why I've included the, the figure here, um, because scale is key and we need to be thinking big in terms of the restoration that we, we roll out now. Um, so the more seeds or shoots that we plant, um, the, the better the chances are of um, increased growth rates and also survival of the seedlings and seeds that we plant. So our vision um, as a combined group and going, going back a number of years, um, discussions have been going about on about um, trying to restore uh, the, the UK's first seagrass um, meadow for many years um, and so we have achieved that in Dale um, where the aim was to plant a million seeds um, covering a two hectare area um, in Dale Bay in Pembrokeshire. Coupled with that was a desire to build um, a supportive community and an education program to um, make sure everyone was aware um, locally and more widespread about the importance of seagrass and about its presence and the threats to seagrass as well that could still exist. So uh, the arrows here just show the, um, the, the most central arrow is originally where the, the meadow was gonna be planted, but the further out arrow is where the meadow um, had been put after a lot of consultation, um, which is still, fine, it's still in an environmentally appropriate area. So why Dale? Um, there are historic records of seagrass in the area. Um, there's been habitat suitability modeling that's been, been run by Swansea University um, that showed that it's appropriate for a seagrass meadow. Many detailed site assessments have gone on over the years and there have been trials put out there showing that seagrass can grow. Um, in that area and using the Hessian bag method. Um, also, initial consultations with stakeholders, local stakeholders, including uh, the Port Authority, members of NRW, um, the Yacht Club and Pembrokeshire Coastal Forum Group were very positive. Um, however, initial consultations and ongoing consultations seemed to be slightly less positive um, and concerns were raised from other stakeholder groups um, who were, were generally most worried about their access being restricted and um, which is completely understandable you know people wanted to know that they would still be able to fish and boat and swim um, in in the area and it wouldn't affect tourism um, so essentially what we want to promote and what we will continue to promote is that seagrass can be restored and we're aiming to res restore it in areas where it's not going to alter people's livelihoods or way of life. Um, so the presence of seagrass is not incompatible with responsible fishing or advanced mooring systems. Um, you know, it's an ideal place to promote tourism because snorkeling in seagrass is so interesting, um, you know, snorkel trails through seagrass are, can be a fantastic way to also introduce people to the ecosystem as well. Um, so seagrass is a resource for everyone. Um, and that's what we want to create is with um, the meadows that we restore is multi-use systems that are sustainable. So after lots of um, intense community meetings um, and compromise, the project and the specific location um, for the proposed two hectares was, was agreed. For the planting, uh, which took place 
the, the first installment went in in March of last year. Um, there were 750,000 seeds planted um, in just under 20,000 seagrass seed bags to cover um, the almost two hectares um, of the meadow in Dale. Um, since then, the, the team have gone back and planted the, the final, done the final push to um, increase that number to a million seeds and covered the, the full two hectares. So, in reality, um, the, this, this is kind of just showing, demonstrating really um, how intense this restoration project has been. Um, so we have laid, uh, sorry, it's a little bit out of date. We, we have laid the, the million seeds and covered the two hectares. Um, and the seeds seem to have um, a great start with the incredible weather that we had since March last, last year, coupled with the very limited access um, of external in influences um, due to the COVID restrictions. Um, but the whole process, is super intensive currently. It relies on a lot of um, person hours. It's very labor intensive. Many, many volunteers were involved in this process, um, which is also a good thing because involving people in the process allows us um, people to take ownership and, and feel like they're part of the project. Um, we work with a lot of different groups, including school groups, um, to put the seeds um, in the seed bags. Obviously, 20,000 seed bags is, is a lot. They were filled with sand before they were, um, had the seeds inserted. Um, a lot of volunteers came out to collect seeds, um, both last year and the year before, that would be ready um, to, to put from the... Um, we have um, a donor meadow up in North Wales where the seeds were collected from. Um, but... It's, it's been done and it's, it's a huge success. Um, the seeds were checked, have been checked not as often as we'd like because we, we can't get into the field with, with a team as, easy, as easily as we would like at the moment. Um, but the seedlings are sprouting and it, it's looking good. Um, there are mature plants. Well, <laughs> they will form mature plants. The plants are starting to grow um, and they will they are looking like the starts of a seagrass meadow. Um, I guess one of the problems with restoration um, and seagrass restoration is it now takes time for us to reach the, the point of a mature seagrass meadow. Um, and that's really just a, a waiting game um, whilst we're monitoring and making sure that nothing, not the seagrass is not coming to any harm. Um, the, we had hoped for more seeds to have germinated, um, but the, the, the the initial planting was later than we'd hoped for. Um, however, there are shoots in clumps um, and the shoots are getting long as these, the, these, the pictures show. Um, so it is looking very, very positive. Um, and now we'll just monitor uh, the meadow going forward. So the next steps, um, seagrass restoration currently remains expensive. Um, and it relies on significant amounts of donor funding and volunteers. Um, there are lots of questions still unanswered um, and failures still happen, although our meadow is looking really good. Um, but we are doing it and we've demonstrated that we, we can do it. Um, we can restore our seas. The costs are falling and they will continue to fall. Um, we are now looking into ways to mechanise the process of seed collection because that's one of the most in, um, labor intensive and restrictive aspects of, of what we can do. Um, you know, a million seeds is a lot of seeds um, and to restore meadows at scale, you'd need a lot more that more than that. Um, but we're looking into that and um, multidisciplinary research from a number of different groups is answering some of the questions that remain. Um, and we're building also on these decades of international research and learning um, from our counterparts in areas like Chesapeake Bay and working with those guys. So it's starting to happen. Um, it's happening in the UK, but it, it really does need wider societal and um, government support. Um, there are bottlenecks at the moment as well that make restoration difficult. So that includes things like the mechanization steps that I've um, spoken about, but also there, there, there isn't policy there to support um, the rollout of seagrass at scale just yet. 
um, or to facilitate it. Um, so really, this is just the start. Um, we, at the moment, we're restoring with the mindset of an allotment gardener um, at the Dale level with the two hectares, but to make real impact in terms of carbon capture and biodiversity support um, and fishery support um, and all the other ecosystem services that seagrass provides, we, we really need to scale it up much, much more. Um, so our next endeavours include a further five hectares in Wales um, and five hectares in Scotland over the coming years. Um, at the moment, we're looking at North Wales and potential areas for restoration there. Um, we're currently working with um, a suite of stakeholders um, to, to try and locate the best um, area that's going to satisfy both social and ecological parameters. Um, so uh, we're also working on um, a, a revised habitat suitability model um, and also thinking about the, the impacts that this would have um, on stakeholders, um, which mostly are positive. Um, so the Scottish site we're looking at is the Firth of Forth, um, and that would be probably a more scattered um, approach to restoration, um, possibly five hectares, but um, not as um, possibly not even as single hectares, maybe as smaller patches of seagrass. Um, but we're just starting to work again with, with stakeholders there to um, look at the, the, the best way that we can do that um, and roll that out. But partnership is absolutely key to this work. Um, we need buy in from, from everyone. Um, that might be involved or might have a stake in these areas and in the seagrass um, and cooperative research <laughs> is also key, um, as well as engaging with stakeholders um, at the forefront. Um, I've also included on this uh, last slide Seagrass Spotter, which is um, the project Seagrass developed app. Um, that is helping to create um, a global database of seagrass location. And um, so it's a mapping tool, basically. Anyone could download it and use it and take georeference photographs of seagrass. And we really need people to be out, anyone that's by the coast doing this so that we get a better idea of, of where seagrass might be and to help us in the <clears throat> sorry, mapping endeavor. Um, so, yeah, and the, the Spotter website has got a really nice interactive map that you can have a look at to see where seagrass is currently, um, whether it's in your area, where there are gaps. Um, so it'd be great if anyone wants to have a look at that or, you know, let us know when, when they see seagrass if they're, if they're out on the coast for any reason. Okay, um, that's it. Thank, thank you for listening. Um, and I will try to answer any questions that anyone has. Also, you're welcome to email me on this address um, here as well if anyone's got more detailed questions. Apologies for my croakiness. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. We've got a couple of questions. Um, so I'll, um, I'll go through them one by one and we'll see, see how we get on. So uh, the first question says, where in Scotland is the next project plan? So I think you mentioned it was probably going to be in multiple locations. But... It's going to be along the, um, we're looking at the first, the fourth, um, and working with the Edinburgh Shoreline project. Um, so that that's that's the start point, hopefully somewhere in the first four. Thank you. OK, so the next question says, how will you ensure these restored areas are not lost due to the same environmental and human factors that have affected other sites? Well, um, the, the, the way we're going about it is we've got a habitat suitability model that's been um, improved at the moment um, and we're using that to tell us where the best place is in terms of environmental parameters. Um, where, as, as I said, water quality has been one of the major issues for seagrass and uh, across the UK that has generally improved. Um, and where that's been the issue and the environmental parameters are right, those are the areas where we can restore. Um, and the, with the rollout of educational programmes and a lot of the work that Project Seagrass does is about raising awareness um, of seagrass, you know, that it's there, exists, it's sensitive habitat, um, we can interact with it, but, you know, it, it is sensitive. 
Um, and so with any further restoration that we do, we will continue to roll out detailed education programs that go with the meadow hand in hand so that we're putting the meadow there and people are aware that it's there and are supportive of limiting any destructive activities. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. That's great. So um, we've got quite a few questions, so we'll see how many we can get through. So we've got um, next question says, great presentation. If possible, could you please provide an indication of the cost of the project compared to the estimated cost benefits for these new carbon stores? The cost of the Dale project was, well, it worked out at 200,000 uh, UK pounds for one per hectare, basically. Um, so the cost is high um, and it is prohibited prohibitive. Um, we are working on reducing those costs. Um, it doesn't cost that much to restore in places like Chesapeake Bay, um, but uh, there, there are processes within um, the restoration procedure, I guess, where we can cut costs if, you know, if we've got the, the capacity to do that. So the mechanization will help massively and um, the top down support will help massively as well. Um, so yeah, it, it is expensive. Um, but also one of the things that I, I really do want to emphasize is that restoring seagrass goes beyond its carbon capture and that value. Um, it has a huge value in terms of carbon capture, um, but also its biodiversity support is incredible um, and unquestionable. So we, we, we really like to contextualize it in that, in that um, sense as well, you know, it's not just about carbon, you're getting all these other amazing benefits, coastline protection, um, nitrogen cycling, uh, fisheries support, you know, they're, incre they're, they're nursery grounds for commercial fisheries, including UK commercial fisheries. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so someone else is asking, how long from planting to maturity? Uh, so that's also one of the um, un unanswered questions um, that, that we're working on at the moment. Um, it varies. It can vary. It could be 10 years. It could be quicker. Um, but, you know, that's also, I think, uh, I'm not sure we mentioned or not, that, that is one of the issues with seagrass is it's not an instant fix. It takes time. But whilst it's growing, it is, you know, starting to um, demonstrate those ecosystem services. And certainly it starts to sequester carbon from, from the outset. Um, but we're hoping to, oh, I know there are other people as well looking at um, carbon sequestration rates from seed to maturity at the moment to get a better idea of what the figures are in the UK from that perspective. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've got quite a lot of questions coming through, so we'll, we'll see how many we get through. But the next question said, did you analyse the sediments for any contaminants that could hinder growth? Sorry, seems that you broke up a bit there. Oh, sorry. It says, did you analyse the sediments for any contaminants that could hinder growth? Um, no, it, in the area, um, in the Dale area, it wasn't necessary. There are other areas that we're looking at that ideally, on the surface of it, look perfect, but might be subject to um, contamination from basically all metal mines. Um, so we will do that at sites where we think that that's a risk. Okay. Brilliant, thank you. Um, okay, so someone else is asking, do you know what the full potential of planting seagrass in the UK is? So i.e. how many hectares in total? Well, if we go off, um, I can't remember off the top of my head what the figure is, but if we go off the fact that we have lost up to 92% of our seagrass meadows, um, and we're currently sitting at around, um, I think it's around 8,000 square kilometers the potential is enormous, um, you know, but some of those areas won't be appropriate anymore for seagrass restoration. However, that giant figure means that there is a huge area that has got the potential. We just need to find where those areas are, the right areas, um, and push it for those areas. Sure, okay. Um, it follows on quite nicely to the next question. It says, does the widespread harvesting of the seed reduce the renewal capacity and viability of existing seagrass beds? It does not. There's, there's been a lot of research on that and we, we don't take um, more seed than we can. That's one of the things that, that we're very much aware of. Okay, brilliant. It's an interesting question next. So it says, is the intention to designate these areas as marine protected areas once established? Which I guess is outside of your... Uh... <laughs> so, um, 
the the Dale area is is within the, um, the Pembrokeshire SAC. Yeah. Um, so it does fall with within that. Um, and I know some tweaks were made um, that stakeholders had requested a, about um, I can't remember the potentially access to seagrass meadow just to make sure it's clear. Um, no, um, I, I would say that's that's not one of our aims. Is you know to create a protected area is to create. Well, maybe it is a voluntary, voluntarily protected area because the seagrass is there and hopefully we can roll out an education program and work with stakeholders. So we're putting these seagrass in areas where we can have this um, multiple sustainable use system rather than any kind of sense of a, a keep out area. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Um, so the next question uh, is around mapping. So it says, you've mentioned there's a gap in mapping and knowledge of seagrass beds. Are you involved in the mapping and do you have plans to increase this research? Uh, yes, we, <laughs> I'm involved in uh, the, the, the um, sense that um, whenever we're anywhere, if we see seagrass, we're locking it on seagrass spotter. <laughs> um, the mapping is difficult. We, we're actually within Project Seagrass, um, the team's just um, about to begin some training with drones and we're hoping that's gonna help us with the, the more wide scale mapping. But because it's so patchy, we really, we don't often know exactly where to start. And that's why um, uh, platforms like Seagrass Spotter are so genuinely useful. Um, and through that, that's really helping us to pinpoint where seagrass is, where we didn't know it was before, or you know, areas where um, we can pick out and go to where it might have been lost. Um, and that, for that, we, we really do need engagement from a lot of people. I mean, Spotter, we, there's a lot of data on there already. It's, it's all um, open access data, but the more people that are using that and helping us map, we as scientists have not got the capacity to map seagrass um, in the fine detail across its range. It's just too widespread. Um, so all the help we can get with that is the better, really. We can, um, I can share a link to the Seagrass Spotter in the chat function in a minute so that people can. That would be great, actually. Yes, thank you. Interesting. Okay. Um, okay. So the next one says, how do you think Sestera Marina will fare under future climate change? Most seagrasses seem to be projected to do well as carbon limitation in meadows declines, but could acidification and marine heat waves act as combined stressors, causing a decline in Sestera meadows, potentially turning sinks into sources? Um. Let me think about the, the, start, the start of that. Can you read that out again? Let me, I might ask that. That's fine. <laughs> there, was, there was a lot to that. So how do you think Sustera will fare under future climate change? Most seagrasses okay. are projected to do well as carbon limitations in meadows decline, but could acidification and marine heat waves act as combined stressors causing a decline, potentially turning... Uh, this is, the, for, for Zostra Mariner um, and um, the temperate North Atlantic contact, context is one of the unknowns um, but yes on the face of it it does look like seagrass will fare um, reasonably well um, in situations of increased temperature and um, ocean acidity. Um, there is evidence um, I think from the tropics of seagrass um, being able to regulate ocean acidic acidity in its immediate environment and basically create a, a more favorable um, environment for coral reefs. But um, I'm, I haven't looked at this for a while, but I'm pretty sure that's still research that's in its infancy. Um, and in the UK, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the unknowns, um, but I, it's, it's not currently looking like that is an, is, is an immediate threat anyway, here. Okay, great. Um, so the next one says, that's a good talk. Um, enjoy your work with Project Seagrass. A little bit off topic, but I'm asking a question on behalf of my girlfriend in the Seychelles. And she's asking me about the purpose of seagrass roots other than stabilizing sediment. Do they uptake nutrients from the sand? Could they what, sorry? Do they uptake nutrients from the sand? Yes, yeah. They, um, they, they take in nutrients and um, a lot of the um, carbon storage of seagrass is actually the below ground stuff. Um, so it stabilizes sediments. Sediments, that's where also it's storing um, the large bulk of the carbon. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so the next question says, would the seagrass bed projects have any other symbiotic relationship with other restoration projects, such as the oyster bed rejuvenation scheme in the Firth? Yes, yes, they would. <laughs> um, absolutely. And 
um, you know, I, I work on seagrass and Project Seagrass is advocating seagrass as an ecosystem that is largely ignored and, and, and needs to be pushed to the forefront. However, I, you know, what we need is um, connected coastal systems. And so, yeah, it, it can go hand in hand with um, oyster restoration, um, mussel bed restoration. Um, and we, we, we need whole, whole um, coastal ecosystem protection, basically, and sustainability. But yeah, they, they can be linked. There's actually um, a project that we're hoping to be involved in that, that is looking at restoring um, seagrass, oyster beds and horse mussels as, as a, a combined strategy, which would be lovely. Yeah, great. OK, um, so quite a few more to get through. So, so have you seen a shift in stakeholder perceptions of seagrass value? Have I seen a shift in stakeholder perceptions? You're biased because you work. <laughs> yeah, um, I think there is a shift, and I I really think you know that the work of Project Seagrass has really really pushed seagrass onto the more mainstream agenda um, and created a lot of um, high profile media attention for the system and. You know we need to continue to work on this but I think in terms of acknowledgement that the seagrass is there um, awareness of seagrass present is is hopefully in increasing and um, stakeholder perceptions are something that are very context specific um, I suppose um, <clears throat> but I think one of the things that um, is positive uh, from, from, from my perspective, is when we can work with stakeholders um, and make sure that, you know, people who work in seagrass or, you know, fishers understand the value of seagrass meadows. Um, but it's nice when we can have those conversations where at the end of it, there's um, a joint understanding of what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it and how um, the seagrass restoration is um, compatible with those activities that might use or rely on the seagrass. So it's, I'm not sure if that answered that question very well. Yeah, that's work in progress. <laughs> okay, great. So um, next uh, question says, uh, great presentation. I wish this restoration effort is as successful, if not more so than the Chesapeake one. My question is, you talked about healthy seeds chosen. So in what terms how did you choose the seeds? Were they from stress tolerant meadows? Was the population? Oh, sorry, no, no, no. The, well, the seeds, if a seagrass meadow is seeding, it's generally a reasonably healthy seagrass meadow. Um, but we use what we know is a healthy seagrass meadow um, where we take, to, um, take the seeds from. I mean, they came from a um, couple, a few different places actually, um, but we do a lot of work in, in North Wales and um, use a seagrass meadow there that's currently, um, incredible and, and looking very healthy. Yeah, so the, uh, the second half of the question was, was it the population relative of one that was already near the restoration site? So I guess North and South Wales, not particularly close. But... No, but same genetic um, population. Yeah, brilliant, thank you very much. Um, okay, so the next one says, thanks Leanne, not to forget the value of healthy blue spaces to people's physical and mental health, social cohesion and well-being. Many studies show the immense value to societies from well-functioning ecosystems and habitats. That's more of a comment, and you highlighted it in terms of ecosystem service value of the yeah. Sea grass best. That's great. Um, okay, next question says, "I'm in Falmouth in Cornwall. I was wondering when the grass blooms, and also when the seeds spawn." Ah, okay. Um, so it the the seeds drop out, or they're usually ready to pick in around about in August. Um, it's a very very small window, um, so we have a very intense two to three week period where um, we last before last year relied on a, a large I mean last year was more difficult because we couldn't have lots of people together in the field um, but a lot of volunteers picking intensively for that two week period in, in August it varies a little bit um, but if you want to see see them seeding and see the seeding shoots of the spades then August is the time to look. Yeah. Okay great thank you. Um, Next question, are there any other promising examples of seagrass restoration in other parts of the world, particularly in the tropics? Sorry, are there any examples of- Are there any other examples of restoration in other parts of the world, so particularly the tropics? In the tropics, I know um, that people have, um, there've been lots of trials in the tropics 
for, for of restoration that have been not all that successful yet. Um, in the tropics, it's the, the context is quite different. Um, I mean, the seagrass is more widespread, um, I suppose. And so, yeah, no, basically, the, <laughs> the, I mean, I'm waffle. the short answer um, is trials have been done, but there's, um, there aren't large areas that have been successfully restored from um, bare sands. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next one, I'm not sure you might have touched on this in the presentation, I think you did briefly, it says how many plants for how many square feet does planting an area require? So I guess what the density you're planting. Sorry, say that again? How many plants for how many square feet does planting an area require? So I guess it's the density of, um, of the planting. How many plants per square feet? Um, <laughs> <You calculate it. laughs> well, there. Uh, so, okay, off the top of my head, I'm, I'm not, the, the denser the meadow, the more complex the meadow, um, the, the, the um, higher it's, basically the more complex it is the more biodiversity it's going to support um, and the more carbon it's going to sequester um, the way that we planted out in Dale I think there are about 50 seeds in each hessian sack and there were 20,000 of those sacks planted over a two hectare area so I can't do the math on the top of my head <laughs> but um, ultimately over time we would we, we would like to go back um, and top up that meadow um, and make sure there aren't, you know, there might be patches that are doing better than other patches and try and make it as dense as we possibly can um, so that it can create um, a healthy and self-sustaining system there. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, um, next question. Is there any commercial or industry interest in sponsoring seagrass restoration? I think you said that there was in relation to carbon sequestration. But... Yeah, yeah, there's, there's been a lot of interest and in the, the Dale project uh, was funded through a partnership um, with WWF and Sky Ocean Rescue, basically Sky Ocean Rescue um, are aiming for uh, net zero. Um, and so that, that's why they wanted to fund it. Yes, there is there is um, increasing interest um, from different corporates in funding seagrass um, restoration. Um, it, would, it would be nice to be in a, you know, off, offsets and, you know, I don't want to advocate for offsets as, a, as an answer, but, you know, seagrass has got this huge potential and it would be nice to be in a position in the future where we can have, you know, more accurate figures of um, per hectare area at different states of the restored seagrass um, maturity, basically. Um, but there are, I mean, the, the, there is funding coming in for um, mechanisation and to do some work in different parts um, of the UK, um, which is largely sort of philanthropic funding. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes left and I think there's quite a few questions so we'll get through as many as we can and if there's any um, that we don't manage to get to we can always um, share the chat with Leanne at the end of this talk and we can, or you can, you can email her directly. So the next uh, question says what species of Zostra did you use for your seeds? Nolte, I think that's right, or Marina, has there been any research into if one species is more resilient than the other against climate change pressures, water quality issues? And we used Zostra mariner um, because the, the meadow in Dale is essentially um, subtidal. And so Zostra mariner is a species um, that you would find in the intertidal to shallow subtidal, whereas Nolti is an intertidal species. Thank you. So next question, someone asking, um, what's the best way to become involved in Project Seagrass in terms of volunteering? Um, we have a Facebook page where we, um, um, a, Seagrass, a Project Seagrass volunteers page on Facebook, sorry, um, where we'll put notices up for um, any any points at which, you know, we're, we're actively seeking volunteers. Um, I mean, in 2019, it, it was incredible because we had all those volunteers that could come out with us and, and help collect the seeds and also help um, sort of at the early part of yet last year get the seeds in. Last summer we had a restricted number <laughs> because of COVID and you know the need for um, obviously social distancing um, 
but yeah have a look at if if anyone's interested the facebook volunteers pages where we'll post and we we so welcome support um, for for all this work because we, we really are relying on um volunteers okay thank you um okay the next question says you mentioned the cost of two hundred thousand per restored hectare does that figure include the cost of research going into the project or is it a pure cost of restoration i.e if you went on to replant another hectare in dale using the same methods would it cost another two hundred thousand? at present it would but it would probably cost a little bit a little bit less um because you know we've we've rolled out um various pro programs of interdisciplinary research in the area that we would not need to do again to expand that area slightly I mean, we still need to do more but yeah that is essentially the cost of planting that meadow um and you know it, it is prohibitive at, at a large scale at the moment and we're really working to to bring that down okay brilliant thank you um so the next one i think you you've answered in part so it's um asking if there is only a single species of seagrass or do you select multiple strands to increase genetic diversity and resilience so no, you mentioned the other intertidal. Yeah, so there, there, are, there are two species that we get in the UK um, and they're basically spatially separate. Um, but mariners, the species that we, we planted down in Dale, mariners, what we're focusing on. Okay, brilliant. Um, so just, oh, someone's worked out the maths for you for the seeds. So <laughs> 107,639 square per feet, per hectare. Thank 500,000 seeds per hectare. <laughs> So five seeds per square foot planted. Brilliant. Thank you very much. For <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so I think that's it. I think we've come to the end. So um, that actually works out quite nicely um, in terms of timings. We've got only a couple of minutes left to go. Um, so thanks very much, Leanne. It was yeah really, really interesting to hear about the progress of the project and lots of really interesting questions as well. Um, obviously lots of interest, so I'm sure you'll get a flurry of volunteers yeah. um, <laughs> when, when you're able to accept them. Uh, <laughs> I've got one final question, so I will ans ask that to you and then we will, um, we'll, we'll leave it there. So someone's asking, has the surrounding area in Dale been surveyed to allow monitoring of seeding from the two hectare area? We, okay, so um, at present, we have not got funding um, specifically to do that, but this is not meadow that we're going to walk away from. And so the meadow will be monitored um, consistently um, over time and we will look at whether it is expanding. Um, beyond the seeded area yeah thank you very much okay well I think that's um it's a good place to to leave it there um as I said we will make the um this talk available on the sustainable places um events pages within a week or so um and if you've got any further questions let us know we can um put you in touch with Leanne um or share any kind of relevant information with you so yeah, thank you very much to everyone for joining us today. Thanks very much, Leanne. Um, we'll have another webinar in two weeks time looking at our Regrow Borneo project. So um, if you're interested, please do take a look and join us. Um, okay, thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.